Greetings geologist and welcome to section 8 over metamorphic rocks. So you see that rock in the picture there? How banded it is? How interesting it looks? So I have a rock right here that's the same thing. Same kind of thing. It's called gneiss. And gneiss is a high-grade foliated metamorphic rock. So in just a little while, you'll be able to identify various different types of metamorphic rocks and understand the unique conditions by which they form. So let's get... So what are metamorphic rocks and why are they special and unique? Not that any other type of rock is not. It certainly is. But metamorphic rocks are more rare than sedimentary and igneous rocks because the conditions by which we form these specific rocks are unique so unique that they really only happen in a very narrow range of opportunity inside the earth. So I want to take a minute to talk about those conditions and then the exceptions to the rule that could happen. So typically we start forming metamorphic rocks right in the subsurface here where you see that green schist facies all the way down even where you can see down here where granulite facies is near a magma pluton. So how can we have such a variable depth of like from 0 and 1 kilometers, maybe a little deeper, all the way to 55-ish kilometers beneath the surface? It has to do with the depth of the burial of rocks, or if it's being uh, rock layers are being subducted and pushed down into the mantle, or if those rocks that are being consumed and assimilated by a hot spot like a magma plume, are being heated but not completely melted. All of those conditions can happen independently or together, I might add, which means that metamorphic rocks are fairly rare in terms of what we see at the surface. So mag magmatic materials underneath the surface are constantly heating up rocks, and those rocks may not completely melt. If that's the case, then we will likely have a metamorphic rock that's made. So metamorphic rocks can come from any rock type, come from an igneous rock that's plutonic or extrusive, meaning one that's intrusive or volcanic. It could be from a sedimentary rock that's been either heated and or pressured and maybe some cool chemical fluids added into that mixture to give a reaction and maybe even a few cool gemstones with it. Or it could be another pre-existing metamorphic rock that gets under those same conditions of heat and or pressure with some chemically active fluids to create something really remarkable. In either of those situations, metamorphic rocks can form but one of the key takeaways today is that metamorphic rocks do not completely melt. If they do, they transcend into a different part of the rock cycle called igneous. So there is a super, super rare metamorphic rock that if you look it up online, it might say half igneous, half metamorphic, which is called magmatite. So the best magmatite I've ever seen is in the Smithsonian. That should tell you how rare I think it is. And having said that, some of the minerals were molten, but the whole rock was not. And I want you to emphasize and focus on that point because remember, all minerals melt and crystallize at different temperatures. So if I have a rock like granite that may have half a dozen minerals in it, we may have some that are molten much faster than some of the others. So you're going to learn how important that particular issue is with relationship to metamorphic rocks. Now, I promised you I'd give you the exceptions to the rule, and here we go with that. So I'd like you to imagine you're a dinosaur. At the end of the Cretaceous period, around 66 to 65 million years ago, you're taking a great sunshine bath on the Chicxulub beach there in the Yucatan Peninsula. That place matters in terms of your location. You're loving life, talking to your fellow dinosaurs, and all of a sudden, this giant meteorite that's about six miles wide comes through the atmosphere, coming in at several hundred thousand miles per hour. And unlucky you, it hits the Yucatan Peninsula head on. All right, so bad day for dinosaurs, obviously. Bad day for the beach, too. <laughs> so what happened was, the Upon impact with that meteorite, 
the sands of that beach completely were shocked. And I don't just mean like, oh, shocked. I mean like literally sauteed. And so it changed the crystalline structure. So when you have an impact shock type situation, we can produce a special mineral called shocked quartz. So there is a type of shock quartz that is made from volcanism, but the amount of crystalline uh, prisms are different in terms of the angles that you have in volcanism versus uh, something in a meteorite collision. There are a lot more of them in a meteorite collision. So that's one way we can differentiate between those circumstances. So I guess it could be a really rare circumstance that a super hot lava flow could almost melt but not completely melt something at the surface like another rock. And I guess that could be a form of contact metamorphism that you'll learn about later. These circumstances are not the norm. Matter of fact, there are exceptions to the rule. So that's why for the sake of this class, unless you become a major in you're in graduate school learning about metamorphic rocks, I'm going to tell you that just about 99%, if not more, of your metamorphic rocks are formed at the zero kilometer down to about 55 kilometers. And you'll understand why we don't really form many past that 55 kilometers here shortly. So we got to talk about country rock and parent rock. So let me tell you about these pictures first because they kind of illustrate the story. So the country rock is could be thousands of layers or thousands of feet of layer of sedimentary, maybe igneous lava flows and ashes, and maybe even some other metamorphic rocks that have been buried beneath the surface. And those, as a whole, those groups are being impacted by heat and or pressure, which could alternate in those thousands of feet of sediment have individual layers of rock, which would be your parent rock. And the parent rock is the rock that actually is the original rock that becomes altered during metamorphism. So let me give you an example. This material right here used to be an intrusive igneous mafic rock. Well, it underwent metamorphism. This was some of the country rock exposed at the surface and it totally altered this thing, made it into something really, really, really cool. And you can tell when you get on it, you're like, oh, it looks so exciting. When you get on it, it is really beautiful. It has this green sheen to it and black sheen to it. And you can tell that it's undergone some heat and or pressure and likely chemical fluid action to it. So I was preparing to go on a sabbatical and wherever I travel, I try to read up on where I'm going. And there are these books that are called The Geology of... So let me talk about parent rock and country rock. Tell you how they're different yet similar. And I'll start with these images that you see here. So we're in Oregon. And this is some exposed rock at the surface. And this is what the rocks are right in here and up in here and here. It's what they look like. And you're like, oh, that's no big deal. What's, what's interesting about that? Well, they're super rare metamorphic type rocks. So before I left for my sabbatical, I did this. I went and did my homework. So I'm going to encourage you as you travel, if you can get these books and they're available for the state that you're traveling in. They're really neat because they actually give you roadside information about highways and, and roads that you could be traveling and the geology that's along them. So the roadside geology of Oregon, I was reading up and I was like, oh, I'm not, I would really like to have some samples of this rock. Well, more complicated was this rock was on public land, specifically national forest land. So I had to go get a permit and ask the Forest Service for permission to collect. And I start, I got it, no problem. They found out what I was doing, what I needed. And they're like, sure, and here's the best place that you can go to find it. So I share that story with you for several reasons. You should ask permission to take rocks when you're in public lands. But second of all, the people who are in these parks, forests, other public lands, know about the cool stuff, right? 
And without their help, I wouldn't have been able to find the super remote ro road that these rocks were located. And you're like, well, how did you get that home? If you were all the way in Oregon, did you drive home? No, I shipped them home and I did flat rate shipping. It's amazing what you can put in those boxes. My mailman didn't really like me that much. It's actually, I had both a mailman and a male woman uh, that serviced my house at the time. And they would always know when I was on vacation because I would send home samples. And they would ask my husband, does your wife like do something with heavy stuff? He's like, oh yeah, they're rocks. And so they're like, oh, figures, it's a geology thing. And it is. But if you find cool stuff and you've gotten permission to, to collect let me advise you to ship them home instead of trying to put them in your luggage. They do not go through airport security very well. So how does this relate to parent rock and country rock? This stuff right here is part of the thousands of feet of sediment that have been buried beneath the surface. You're like, but it's at the surface, Elaine. That's correct, but it wasn't before. It had been buried deep enough to metamorphose into this, and then it got shoved back up, or weathered and eroded down to, allowing for that rock to be exposed. So the thousands of feet or groups of sedimentary layers, igneous rocks and metamorphic rocks that are being altered are called country rock. But the precise rock that is being changed is called the parent rock. So I'll give you a more straightforward example that you would relate to. Shale, which is mudstone. When shale gets metamorphosed, Slightly, it can turn into a rock that makes up most pool tables, which is slate. Slate is a low-grade foliated metamorphic rock. And then you add a little more heat and pressure and you can end up with another rock. And we'll get to them shortly. But the point is, is the parent rock is the rock that is being altered. So you may get to be a major one day and find out that there's a way to chemically determine the actual composition of a sample that you may take. It's fairly complex and you'll have to break down the rock into a powder form, go through a process to get it to be reviewed by a scanning electron microscope or other technologies, and then you can exactly see what you're dealing with. Otherwise, we have to look at other clues for metamorphic rocks to understand what its true parent rock was. So I wanna talk about metamorphic facies for a minute. I'd like you to think about maybe using college majors as an example of facies. So let's say we have an English major. Let's say we have an art major. Let's say we have a history major. Let's say that we have a social worker or psychology person uh, that has a major. Let's say that we have a science major. More specifically, let's say we have somebody studying to be a nurse. So they're doing anatomy, physiology, or maybe they're going to be a nurse practitioner or a doctor. Maybe we have somebody that's going to be a chemist. Maybe we have somebody that's going to be a geologist or a biologist or an ecologist. Point is, is they're very specific conditions and classes that would qualify for you to be a major in any of those categories. That's kind of what happens with metamorphic facies. Very specific conditions must exist for metamorphic rocks to form in what's called metamorphic facies. So I'm going to pick one out of the whole bunch. I'll address another, but one in particular because I have a really cool story. And it's called blue schist facies. And you're like, well, I can see it's blue. Not all blue schist facies is blue. Okay, But this particular sample is, and it's out in California. So my point being is that here's the story you see. All right, it's got some depth, comes to about here, almost where magma could be. So that's a pretty interesting range of depth. Well, let's find out a little bit more about it because blue schist facies has very rare circumstances. In most textbooks that you would buy from a major manufacturer or publisher, you would see this diagram going to a depth of about 55 kilometers. And you'd see the kilobar range, which is pressure, going to about 14 kilobars. But you will see just about this temperature range, maybe up to 1,000 degrees Celsius on those same diagrams. So why did I choose this one? This one actually showed you the story about blue schist, rapidly subducting plate. So let's take a look at the temperature requirements first to make metamorphic facies known as blue schist. 
So it starts right below 100, because here's its boundary marker here. Let's see where it's the hottest. It comes up, so right about 300 degrees C. And you can see it starts forming at a depth. Let's come right over here. So right about a depth of probably around 13 kilometers beneath the surface, and can go all the way down to about 35 kilometers. But the kilobars is pretty interesting. Just like in ocean, we were talking about atmospheres of depth compounding the amount of pressure. That's what kilobars represent beneath the surface. So the immense amount of weight of rock layers above a rock layer being metamorphosed can truly alter, compact, compress, and actually change the chemistry of that particular rock, especially as you're going deeper where heat is involved. In this particular case, we have a little bit uh, more than four kilobars all the way down to just past 13 or right at 13 kilobars. So what's the real story here? You're like, that's a lot of information. Like, <laughs> It is, but let's think about it. If you've gone deep enough in the subsurface to go all the way from somewhere like 13 kilometers down to 35-ish kilometers, and you've only heated up to a temperature of about maximum 300-ish degrees Celsius, that means that your plate was subducted fast, stayed there at a depth deep enough to form blue schist species, then got shoved back up quickly, of course, in geologic reference time. So you're like, how does that happen? So maybe we have a subducting plate, and then we get hit by another plate collision, or we have rapid erosion that brings that up to the surface. That's how that can happen. So obviously, that's fairly rare set of circumstances to make that type of metamorphic facies. Now let's look at another one. Let's talk about granulite for a minute. So granulite actually is a metamorphic facies where you get a lot of granite and other igneous rocks that can be uh, metamorphosed and there's a lot bigger opportunity to form them. So let's look at it. First of all it forms at depths probably starting around eight and a half to nine kilometers. Uh, in kilobars it comes up to about two and a half to three, not too deep, and then you get it's starting in temperature probably around 750 to 775 degrees Celsius. You can't make it before that temperature. And that makes sense because granite, most of those rocks form somewhere around the crystals that make them up, the minerals, somewhere around 650 to 800 degrees Celsius. So that's in tune. But the point is, is you can make it all the way almost to 40 uh, kilometers in depth. So you're getting close to your magma chambers. So you're going to form a lot more granulite than you are blue schist facies. So when you think about metamorphic facies, we need to get a little bit more specific and we can use what are called metamorphic zones, which are identified by a precision type index mineral. So kind of like we have birthstones for January through December, I would like to kind of call the index minerals for metamorphic zones kind of like your birthstones. They are very specific. So we're looking for a particular mineral like chlorite would represent very low grade metamorphism and then you start getting all the way down to granulite which I just described as a very high grade metamorphic type of situation and you're looking for specific precision minerals that help you identify that. Like well why should I care? Good question because if we find those in the field, it helps us piece together the past, helps us piece together what was going on in terms of geologic conditions. So I'd like to bring up another important mineral that we look at for metamorphic rocks, and that is something called zircons. Now that you know about metamorphic facies and metamorphic zones, there's a specific mineral that we look for in igneous and metamorphic rocks for that matter, even sedimentary rocks, and they're called zircons. They help us age date rocks, and here's why. These were some of the very first minerals that crystallized when the Earth started its initial cool down at the very beginning of the Precambrian Eon back in the Hadean. So we're talking about within the first several hundred million years of the Earth's existence, zircons started to be made. What's important about that is that zircons just don't get remelted anymore because we don't have a hot enough magma chamber capable of doing such a thing. So that means that they can get new layers added to the crystalline structure and if we want to examine those layers we can piece together the Earth's history. So this is an example of that. You can see the multiple layers 
in these zircons of crystalline structure. Those are all history markers. So I'd like you to think of it almost like a time card. And we can look at those and examine them in laboratory settings and analyze kind of what's happened to rocks. Zircons are so fascinating and they're very durable too on the most hardness scale. So they stick around in terms of even, even microscopic uh, conditions in rocks. We can find them in just about all rocks. So when we find really good zircon crystals, they help us take a look back in geologic time. With that in mind, we can move on to looking at the agents of metamorphism. Heat is the very first one. So there are really three of them, heat, pressure, and uh, chemically active fluids. So let's start with the heat first. And let me be clear that you can have metamorphism with one of these agents of metamorphism, two, or all three happening at the same time. Oftentimes, they happen in conjunction with one another, but sometimes they don't. So heat is the very first one, and you can have a magma chamber that can heat up rocks. So this would represent like your country rock that we just learned about. Do you see this halo effect right here? These are called aerials, and we'll get to them in a minute. So this magma chamber, this stuff right here, that's the Columbia River basalt. Well, inside of that uh, mountain there in Oregon State, in Washington State, this one's actually in Oregon, um, you would have a magma chamber that solidified. So whatever right adjacent to this magma chamber that was incapable of being melted, in other words, you could have gone right to the boundary marker of almost being melted but not completely molten to push that rock into the igneous category, that would be a metamorphic rock. We'll still look a little bit more at heat. So if you recall, we were looking at the metamorphic facies diagram and it showed kind of like a maximum temperature of around 800 degrees, maybe up to 1,000. Well, there's a reason why we don't form metamorphic rocks much below that marker, certainly below 1,000 degrees C, and it's because it's just too hot. When we learned in Dynamo Earth about the different layers of the Earth, we learned that the core was the hottest and the heat came from the decay of radioactive elements such as uranium. With that in mind, the opposite is true. When you're going from the crust at the surface all the way down to the core, you'll have a progressive increase of temperature. So as you recall back in Dynamo Earth, we learned about the core and the core is what gives off the heat from the radioactive decay of elements like uranium. And as we go up towards the surface, it gets cooler, right? Well, the opposite is true if you're at the surface working your way down to the core. It's going to get gradually hotter. And in fact, there is an average called geothermal gradient. So the average is approximately 25 degrees Celsius per single kilometer you travel down. So if you're traveling down, let's say, 40 kilometers, you'll probably be hovering somewhere between 600 and 800 degrees C, just depending on what's going on down there. You could have a magma chamber that can make it slightly hotter. So this diagram actually illustrates, this would be kind of like the narrow opportunity right in here to form metamorphic rocks. And when you start getting below that thousand degree C mark, I guarantee you we've gone too far. We've just gone, you can see it's just a hundred kilometer marker here. At that point, you'd be forming igneous rocks. So that narrow range is important because what happens in each one of those kilometers as we go down, we're getting a gradual increase in temperature naturally via geothermal gradient. So the second agent of metamorphism is pressure. So we're going to learn about two different types of pressure today, lithostatic and differential pressure. Let's start with lithostatic. While that may sound fancy, just think about what litho means. You've already learned about the lithosphere, so that's the crust, right? And the upper, upper layer of the mantle. So lithospheric refers to the weight of rock layers above other rock layers that can add pressure. That's what it means. It's all it is. So when you get pressure applied to rock layers from overlying rocks, could be thousands and tens of thousands of feet of them, that's naturally going to add weight and pressure. That pressure can add enough weight to, and remember, it'll be buried by, in depth by a geothermal gradient being impacted by heat. The two together can cause really interesting things to happen to rocks. For example, you see some phaneritic texture here that uh, matches your salt and pepper granite. Over here, I've got striped rocks or banded rocks. This granite went to being nice. 
with lithostatic pressure. Differential pressure varies from lithostatic pressure in this way. You have more pressure being applied on one side of the collision impact as compared to another. For example, let's say you had two cars traveling, one was 5 miles an hour, one was 60 miles an hour, and they hit head on. Well, you could imagine that the impact would be very different and the result of crash problems would be different for both vehicles, right? You're going to have uh, problems with both. Both are going to be wrecked, but probably the one moving faster could experience more damage, or maybe even the one going slower that got hit with such great force. That's what happens with earthen materials, where it could, let's say you have a plate moving at a couple of centimeters a, a year, and you have one moving at 17 centimeters a year. The 17 is like rapid fast in geologic history, while the two centimeters per year is pretty slow. So what will happen is when you get these plate collisions like convergent plate boundaries, differential pre pressure can cause deformation to be more severe on one side of the collision versus the other. So we've done heat and we've done pressure as the agents are metamorphism. Let's get to chemically active fluids. Chemically active fluids is where the magic happens in metamorphic rocks. So this rock you see here is called SCARN. SCARN is a very unique metamorphic rock that's formed from chemically active fluids. And in most cases, chemically active fluid-based metamorphic rocks uh, start making unique stuff when you get the water and carbon dioxide that's in most every rock that heats up and is allowed to freely move around, which can make really new cool stuff. And that's the, the special ingredients that I would say that changes the chemistry of metamorphic rocks. So now that we learned about the three agents of metamorphism, let's move into the three specific types of metamorphic uh, conditions. So metamorphism can happen one of three ways, through contact metamorphism, dynamic metamorphism, or regional metamorphism. So in order of frequency, it would go regional is the most common, contact's the next most common, and then dynamic's the least common. So we're going to talk about each one. We'll start with contact metamorphism. So when you have an igneous rock, metamorphic or sedimentary rock, and they are altered by primarily heat, then you're going to have contact metamorphism. And this is a case in point. Do you see the halo right here? These are all your country rocks here. And the halo represents rocks that were almost igneous, but not quite. So they're metamorphosed high-grade metamorphism. Let me even go a step further by saying the closer you are to the magma chamber, like this batholith, the higher the grade metamorphism would be in that aerial, and the lower the grade would be as you get way out here. So in nature, you can often get a situation, so if this is your uh, country rocks here, you'll see a metamorphic rock here, an igneous rock that's solidified in the middle where you got your volcanic pipe, now a volcanic neck, and you'll see the metamorphic on the other side of that pipe. So either side, it matches. And then it goes back to sedimentary over here. I've seen this in the field with hornfells, which is a type of metamorphic rock, uh, similar to quartzite, but not. And so what happens is that the sedimentary rock gets altered, and you get the igneous rock in the middle and the sedimentary rock that's been metamorphosed on either side, which is your hornfells. And then you get the sedimentary rocks over here unaltered. Dynamic metamorphism may be the most rare, but it does happen. And it very commonly along major fault zones, let's say even like the San Andreas Fault. So when you have high differential weathering, geez, when you have high differential pressures at fault zones, dynamic metamorphism can happen. So this could occur maybe along the San Andreas Fault, which is exactly what you're kind of seeing here. And uh, this will change minerals where an extreme amount of pressure is applied. So unlike contact, which dealt primarily with heat, this one primarily deals with pressure. So let's move into the one that's the most common, that's kind of the combo. So imagine you're going through the drive-thru and you're about to order and you have the option for a combo meal. That's how I feel about regional metamorphism. By far the most common, 
And what will happen is you have usually mountain building that occurs from various different plates colliding or maybe a volcano building. And what will happen is you get, let's say you have a subducting plate, it'll subduct down and then it heats up stuff and creates like country rock and creates magma plumes, which in turn creates metamorphic conditions. So you can have both contact going on and also regional at the same time. But in terms of regional, we can form all grades of metamorphic rock from the surface down to about that 55 kilometer, and we are having the combo of heat and or pressure applied to a rock. So now that you know about the three types of metamorphism, contact, dynamic, and of course regional, let's get into the two texture terms. So just to review, igneous rocks have two textures, phanaritic and aphanitic. Sedimentary have two textures which would be detrital slash clastic or chemical slash biochemical. Subsequently, metamorphic rocks also have textures and they are either foliated or non-foliated. So stuff like dynamic metamorphism and regional will create foliated. Non-foliated is primarily formed in some type of a contact metamorphic condition. So foliated texture is trying to, with pressure and likely geothermal gradient with heat, is taking crystals and all arrangement minerals and aligning them in a more parallel fashion. So your lowest grade foliated rock is something like slate. It could have been like a mudstone shale originally. So slate metamorphosis, just a tad more, you get phyllite. You can almost see that wavy appearance in the phyllite, and that also has a metallic sheen. Then you get into schist, love schist. It's very uh, glittery, and you'll learn why in just a few minutes. And then it could have little gifts like these. These are garnets. Very foliated, has a platy schistostasy texture. And then the last texture that we see, special type of property in foliated metamorphic textures is banding. And banding is a, a rock called gneiss. So when we look at all three of these in a little bit, you'll understand why they're special. Let's talk about non-foliated texture. These metamorphic rocks are impacted by heat and they do not exhibit a metamorphic texture where you have the parallel arrangement of crystals, mineral crystals. Instead, what will happen is the mosaic of minerals, like this one almost looks like a phaneritic texture, but it's not, will recrystallize as you go up in grade of metamorphism. So non-foliated rocks can be low grade, moderate grade, and high grade, even for the same rock. This is all quartzite right here, which is metamorphosed quartz sandstone. So this was your lowest grade, intermediate, and highest grade. And if you can see in this one, there are bigger crystals because it's had time to almost reach that melting point, but not quite, because it's undergone an extreme temperature change. So when we look at metamorphic conditions by which we form these rocks, the most common place test question to form them would be convergent plate boundaries. Sure, I can find them at divergent plate boundaries. Sure, I can find them where I have transformed plate boundaries at fault zones. But the most common place is at subduction zones to be exact at convergent plate boundaries. Now, going back to that emphasis of where do we form metamorphic rocks? It's this special place right in here. When I get below that place, I can't form it. And remember, there is just a super, super rare circumstance you could form it right at the surface. So for testing purposes, we will call this the stuff that forms in that narrow range of about zero kilometers down to about 55 kilometers. So I do want to quickly talk about the grades of metamorphism from low, moderate to high and explain, we're going to use foliated rocks as an example. See how the temperature says 200 here? So this would be zero over here. And then we get to high grade to 800 right in here. And you see where melting is? Melting would be somewhere above 800 to about 1,000 degrees, depending on the mineral assemblages that you have. So I want to point out, you know, slate's pretty low grade. And it, matter of fact, it's always low grade. But this is the high end of slate. And you can see it can form minerals like a little muscovite and chlorite and clay minerals, and it gets no more than like 300 degrees C. Then you get to phyllite, and the higher end of phyllite, it's borderlining that intermediate grade. But look at all that you can form from here to here. So if you take that quartz, feldspar, kyanite, starlight, garnet, just a tad bit of garnet, lots of biotite and muscovite. 
That is what makes it have a metallic sheen. So if we get into schist, look at schist from this side to where it kind of boundary markers to nice. You can make quartz, feldspar, starlight, lots of garnet. You can see that on either side of schist, you can make garnets all day long. Some biotite and muscovite because that's where we get the shininess and the metallic sheen and schist. But when I get into nice, look what happens. I can make a little of the garnet, maybe a tad of the biotite, so some nights may have a little bit of metallic sheen, but they're not going to look anything like schist. Instead, they have been so uh, impacted by heat and pressure that you align those minerals in a banded form. These two samples, I have a black piece of slate and a red piece of slate. The coloring is all about the minerals that are present, so that color is not dictating what type of metamorphic rock I have in slate. It is simply the characteristic of it going from something like the ash or the shale and being compressed under pressure with some heat. The next grade up from slate, and it's not that it's gone from low to intermediate, it's somewhere in between that, is phyllite. So as I went through the chart of the different minerals that's in your book, phyllite is one that kind of has a wavy appearance on the top. Most phyllite, not all. The lower the grade phyllite, closer to slate, the more it's going to look like slate, but it still will have more of a metallic sheen. Phyllite in general will have that metallic sheen because there's substantial amounts of biotite and muscovite slash mica that uh, has been altered due to metamorphism. So from slate to phyllite, we've just increased a little bit in intensity of grade of metamorphism and enough to change the mineral properties so the rock looks more metallic and has more of a wavy appearance on its top. When you metamorphose that same thing and get it to more of an intermediate, even to on the lower side of high grade metamorphism, you can form a rock called schist. Schist is so beautiful. It's also, in most cases, pretty flaky. What I mean by that is it has little plates on top. So the platy uh, sub characteristic of schist is referred to as platy or schistostasy characteristic. So in the form of schist, this platy texture thing, if you thump that rock, it will usually put some uh, of those plates on the table, the little bitty crystals. And that is a good example of moving into the higher grade metamorphism because it's actually changing and transforming those muscovite and biotype type minerals into a different type of more parallel arrangement of those mineral crystals. By the way, these little gifts right here are those garnets. Remember me talking about garnets forming, and most of them anyway, and that really important range of schist temperature? Well, that's the case here. So all your garnets are going to come from this type of situation metamorphically. Getting into my personal favorite of all the metamorphic rocks is nice. And nice always has bands slash stripes. So in addition to being foliated, nice always has a high grade texture. And that's because you have gone from just having the schistostasy from the intermediate to high to having banding. So some metamorphic nice will have a little bit of metallic colors in it. I can see a little bit of reflectivity here and here and here of some of those uh, metallic minerals, but not very much so. As the higher grade you get, the more just solid lines you're going to get in that particular rock. So nice is our highest grade metamorphic rock that we're going to see in our class. And as we move into non-foliated rocks, let me just take a moment to reemphasize that pressure plus heat typically is what forms our foliated metamorphic rock. There's still one more rock that I want to talk about in the foliated category, amphibolite. So it's not that this is a higher grade metamorphic than nice. It's just one that has a matching non-foliated characteristic to it, and that is because the parent rock is the same in both cases. So the parent rock is mafic igneous rock, which would either be lava, which would be basalt, or the intrusive slash plutonic equivalent, which would be gabbro. So if it undergoes some form of foliation, which is where the crystals are being aligned in a more 
parallel fashion, igneous mafic rock will actually turn into this, amphibolite. Non-foliated metamorphic rocks can come in low, intermediate, or high-grade conditions. Another word for intermediate would be moderate. It means the same thing. So this all happens because of the amount of temperature that this rock experiences. Very little pressure is involved, if any, with non-foliated metamorphic rocks. So they do not have that parallel arrangement of crystals. Instead, it looks like they've kind of been reworked by heat, but they're never fully melted. If they are, then they would become an igneous molten rock. Not the case. So quartzite is a very, very common type of non-foliated metamorphic rock. When you look at this one right here, the color doesn't matter. That's all that the parent rock of the sandstone that got metamorphosed. So it kind of looks like the crystals just kind of got glued together. This is pretty much what the original sandstone looked like with a little bit of heat added. When you metamorphose them again, you get bigger crystals that have a chance to recrystallize. And then the highest grade, you would see even larger crystals that it, the re-metamorphic process is happening each time where more crystalline regrowth can happen within that sandstone. So remember that quartzite is not... The parent rock is not quartz, it's quartz sandstone, guaranteed assessment question. And that is one of those things that I expect you to know because quartzite is super common. So let's look at marble, another very common non-foliated metamorphic rock. So the mosaic here kind of looks like it could have phanaritic texture, but it does not. It's not an igneous rock. As a matter of fact, before it became metamorphic, it was one of two rocks. It was either limestone or dullestone. So it's a calcium carbonate based rock, sedimentary. So if you have pure marble like this one, marble tends to be white unless you get impurities in it. And the impurities actually add to the intrinsic value of marble, just so you know. And so sometimes you can see some streaks in marble that may appear to have banding that does not trump it as nice. In other words, marble still has uh, crystals that are not aligned in a parallel fashion, even if those streaks are observed in it. So the parent rock is important for marble. Just like quartzite, it can come in a low grade, moderate grade, or high grade. Most of your statues that are carved out of marble can't be too high of a grade or else it's very difficult to manipulate and carve. So typically it would be lower to maybe an intermediate grade that you would see your statues and things of that nature made out of marble. Another famous non-foliated metamorphic rock is greenstone. You may know this as jade. Not all jade is green, by the way, but the parent rock of greenstone slash jade is, again, a mafic igneous rock, just like amphibolite. The difference is, unlike amphibolite, the greenstone slash jade has not had its crystals arranged in a parallel fashion. Instead, it looks more like what you would see the mosaic of crystals that are being impacted by heat. Just as an FYI, since I've been to New Zealand in some of those uh, Polynesian territories, I can tell you that this group of people, like the Maori, for example, are very much viewing jade as an important stone to their culture. So much so that they would consider it bad luck, almost an omen, if you bestowed a piece of jade upon yourself. So the jade that's exchanged in their culture has very significant meaning and also it involves an honor that came from someone else. Have somebody else buy you jade if you're going to get it and give it to you. So I, I don't know, I kind of think it's a neat story just to know that jade is viewed that way by certain cultures. And I have some jade that people have given me and it's a beautiful, beautiful set of stones. Like I said, it's not always green. But it does have an array of colors, but it's all about the grade of metamorphism that helps create that situation. So there's one more of these metamorphic rocks, but I put it in an other category. You're like, wow, can it be non-foliated or foliated? It can be either, actually. <laughs> Depends on the grade of metamorphism. Obviously, a meta conglomerate, the parent rock would be a sedimentary conglomerate, and that is always the case for this rock. The difference is, 
If it's foliated, you're going to have a higher grade of metamorphism for the metaconglomerate pressure that would flatten out those clasps, making them more having more of a uh, parallel arrangement of minerals and clast. However, a lot of metaconglomerates are non-foliated because they, ha they haven't had much pressure applied to them. So you're not going to see nearly as much of this as you will see like slate, violite, schist, or gneiss, or marble, or quartzite, or even jade, or amphibolite. You're not going to see metaconglomerates often in my experience. But nevertheless, I think you should know about it. Key points about metamorphic rocks. Metamorphic rocks form from any other type of rock, including another metamorphic rock. So just in a second, I'm going to show you this place right here, right outside of Sequoia National Park in California, and explain why this is such an important metamorphic rock. Remember that metamorphic rocks do not melt completely. If they did, they would transcend into the igneous rock category. Instead, they are impacted by heat and or pressure, and we can't leave out those chemically active fluids, right? And remember, the texture is either foliated or non-foliated. So let's show you Sequoia and this very important piece of gneiss. Welcome to Sequoia National Forest. In front of me is a really great piece of gneiss. And what makes this chunk of gneiss so special is the amount of compression that's shown where you can almost see a zigzag pattern in the rock. So how does something like that happen? It happens because a plate compresses against another one during some kind of an uplift of a mountain event. So during an orogeny, which is a mountain building event, this rock was underneath the surface of the earth and got highly squashed. You have to imagine it used to be granite. But you can totally see how much compression occurred in this rock. So this represents high-grade metamorphic conditions before this rock had a chance to melt. So really special rock for you to see. This is a form of gneiss, and it shows you some great folding inside of that rock. I'll see you at the next stop. Bye. So welcome back from Sequoia National Park. What do you think about that gneiss? Pretty awesome stuff, right? You've got to have high-grade metamorphic conditions to form gneiss. That's what makes it so special. And remember, the texture for gneiss is always foliated, and it always has a high-grade metamorphic condition. So as we move into the very concluding moments of metamorphic rocks, I just want to let you know something like this, which is still the gneiss at Sequoia, can only happen in very unique circumstances, primarily at convergent plate boundaries or the most common places at subduction zones specifically, that we can form metamorphic rocks. Hope you've enjoyed learning about these very special rare rocks and understand since most of them are formed subsurface, when we get them where we can see them at the surface, that means that one of two situations has occurred. First, they've either been shoved up and pushed up because of a mountain building event, exposing them from beneath the surface where they formed, or two, they have been weathered and eroded down to and they're now exposed. And it could be a combination of both, and you would see them at the surface. So I hope you enjoy your nature moment, and have a super day. I will be seeing you back for Section 9, which is the rock cycle. Bye.